Warning, the following program contains scenes of death. Hard working, respectable, a good neighbor. I guess you could say that John Wayne Gacy were a regular pillar of society. But I guess you could also say that he was an ass fucking homicidal maniac. Which goes to show that nobody knows nobody that well. Chicago, Illinois, 1942. The only son of Marion and John Casey Sr. The family were working class, with the father working in a factory, and the mother a clerk at a pharmacy. And I guess it's safe to say that John Jr. was a disappointment. His father being an alcoholic, judgmental, and as his son was overweight and not very good at sports, I suppose as a father, wanting your kid to be in your likeness, it weren't ideal. Casey Sr., who were often drunk, would abuse the mother and the son. Although never been proven, it's believed that that abuse was also sexual. And rarely did the father use his son's name, preferring to use Mama's Boy, Sissy, Faggot, and other names too cruel to mention. And it didn't get any easier when the insecure child entered his teens because the kid became a hypochondriac, complaining about body aches, sore joints, being out of breath easily, which only confirmed to his father that he were a loser. At 11 years old, he was struck by a swing. The playground accident seemed to permanently change John Jr.'s demeanor. Headaches, blackouts, a quick temper. He even started pissing the bed, but his father said he were faking it to get attention. And perhaps to deal with that mental and physical abuse at home, he became a compulsive liar and got a reputation of being a braggart at school, making up tales of fancy, playing himself off like a big shot. I suppose he had what could be considered the gift of the gab. Could talk himself out of anything. At age 16, he was diagnosed with a heart ailment and started taking medication. I guess he really was weaker than the rest. By 1960, Casey decided to leave home, strike out on his own, and move to Vegas. Guess if any place is gonna make you a man, Vegas will. Just the roll of the dice, and you'll end up balls deep in someone or something. John quickly got himself a job at a funeral home as a cleaner. And yeah, sure, the pay sucked, but at least it was at night by himself, and no one were watching. But there was talk among staff of improprieties. Rumors, one may say. Bodies being moved and undressed. Found in weird positions. Liquid leaking from them. But it was when one employee came forward and said that he'd seen Casey going down on the body of a boy who'd been involved in an automobile accident. And although the employee were later to retract this accusation, it's believed that it was only after Gacy had threatened the older man's life. And despite these indiscretions being put on public record, there are incidences that Gacy continued to deny. They got me a job with Paul Mortuary, being the night man picking up bodies at the hospitals and stuff for them. I worked as a night man only. I did have nothing to do with the bodies. All this talk that I slept with the dead ones or, or had sex with dead bodies, that there is no truth to any of that. You didn't live in the um, mortuary? I lived in the mortuary, yes, but not in the okay. embalming room. I mean, they make it sound like you know I slept in the crypts with them. And I never climbed into a coffin or anything like that. That, that is so damn ridiculous. And besides, the dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. Liar, liar, pants on fire. We all know what you desire. Whether it was because of that temptation or because it was just a dead end job, Casey packed up his bags and with what little money he'd saved, returned to Chicago. Or once back in Chicago, he enrolled in business college. And I guess for once you could say that Gacy had found his calling in life. The fat boy with the gift of the gab. Well, he were a born salesman. And at age 21, he became manager of a shoe store, which I guess he figured was a step up in life. It was in 1964 that Gacy met 
and married a co-worker, whose father must have seen some promise in the up-and-coming cock gobbler, because he made him regional manager of a chain of Kentucky Fried Chicken outlets, which I guess you could say were ironic, considering how much John Jr. liked his fresh meat. Finger looking good indeed. Right after getting married, Gacy and his wife had two kids in quick succession, almost like he were trying to prove something. And by all accounts, he were a rising star, popular within his community, but he had a dark side. Maybe it was the memories of those nights in Vegas, getting cozy with the corpses. But it's been documented that more than one serial killer got their start after being familiar with stiffs. It was when his wife was away for the weekend at a state visiting relatives with a kid that John Jr. brought home a teenage boy. They drank, watched porn, and then Casey offered to show him a magic trick. Then he handcuffed the kid to the bed and he ass fucked him. Police reports say that the attack was brutal, but unlike the dead, this boy were able to talk and he went straight to the cops and squealed. And Gacy were arrested and given a 10 year sentence for sodomy and confinement. The 26 year old up and coming businessman went now out of business. But I suppose that one could lyrically wax that if life gives you lemons, why not make lemonade? Because by all accounts, John Jr., he didn't mind prison life too bad. Maybe it were getting away from the nagging wife and two kids. Or with a steady flow of ass pussy. But Gacy flourished inside and enjoyed his new home, having hidden his crime from his fellow inmates. And he was now becoming a pillar of a different kind of community. I guess you could say a community of ass fuckers. And you're a man of some authority here. What, what is your title? Well, I'm first cook in the kitchen, and I run the, uh, the morning meal and the afternoon meal in the kitchen. John, how long have you been here? I've been here now a year and about two weeks. Well liked by both guards and prisoners. He seemed to be doing better on the inside than he had done on the outside. Older than his fellow inmates, I guess you could say he developed a fatherly influence on him and remarkably all of this while hiding the fact he was inside for raping a child as while serving his sentence that his father died someone he'd spent his life at odds with but still had a profound effect on him told two days after the death he fell to the floor and started sobbing like a baby murderous cocksucking baby desperately asking prison officials if he could attend his father's funeral it was denied but don't you feel bad about john jr because he was able to turn that 10-year prison sentence into an 18-month stretch after being released early for good behavior gacy returned back to chicago now divorced he didn't want to waste any time and showing everybody that he was an upstanding citizen. Get married to a childhood friend, a divorcee with two children, and they moved into Gacy's house together. Real cozy-like, fucking American dream. But it were all a facade, because Gacy only had one thing on his mind, and that was ass pussy. It was only a year later that Gacy was arrested for disorderly conduct, when he picked up a young boy in his car and tried to forcefully fuck him. But when the kid didn't show up at court, case would drop. In 1972, he would charge for battery, forced a 12-year-old to suck him off. How do you like them apples? But the case was dropped. John Jr. now had a taste for it. And when you got that taste, I guess you want to put your tongue in it. Timothy McCoy was just 15 years old when Gacy picked him up at a midtown bus station, his favorite hunting ground where runaways would convene. He offered the teen 50 bucks to come home with him so he could play hide the salami. When he got the kid home, he put on some porn, pulled out a bottle of whiskey, and he got busy on his ass. By all accounts, it were fucking messy, just how Gacy liked it. But for whatever reason, only known to Gacy, in the morning, when the kid was making him breakfast, he came up to serve Gacy breakfast in bed, but he was still holding the knife that he'd been cutting up the bacon with. And as he entered the bedroom, Gacy pulled the knife from him, stabbed the kid five times in the chest. By police's own account, 
there was shit on the bed And they thought it could have been a homo rendezvous gone bad And perhaps because it was a punk runaway Or for whatever reasons only known to the cops They let Gacy go without charges Believing his story that it was a robbery gone wrong Even though the stiff were leaking jizz But for Gacy, it now meant that he had a serial killer hall pass I got in the car with him, and shortly after I got in the car with him, he placed a rag over my face, of which turned out to be chloroform, and proceeded to have a lengthy drive, and every time I would come to, the rag would go back over my face, and I remember him carrying me into his house, and then he put the rag over me, and that's the last thing I remember until I found myself about 5, 5.30 in the morning on the steps. Half-dressed, my face completely burned. Blood coming out of my ass. And with his wife, now taking the kids to her parents each weekend, it gave Casey the opportunity to go cruising to all the homo hotspots, picking up young hustlers and runaways with 50 bucks in his pocket. I had a ticket to paradise. Ass fuckers paradise. Turn right at the ball sack and drive straight up. It was 1974 when Casey would commit his second murder. Picking up what is believed to be a 14-year-old boy in a video arcade. Cold, hungry, I guess for the runaway. Gacy's offer might have seemed appealing. Gacy took him home, fed him, handcuffed him to the bed, and said he was gonna show him a magic trick. But the magic trick was how to make a grown man's cock disappear. When he got bored, he strangled the kid and put him in a closet. The next day, there were a foul odor. When he checked the body, there were black liquid coming out of the kid's mouth. He told investigators that from then on, when he killed someone, he stuck their underwear in their mouth to prevent this problem. He buried the kid in the backyard next to the barbecue. I always put 110% into it, because I figure if you're going to get involved in something, then, then do it right. So I was involved in politics, I was involved in community services, and even as young as, as 22, 23 years old, I was honored as Man of the Year in Springfield, Illinois, and I was involved in a lot of projects there. I moved to Waterloo, Iowa, I was honored as Man of the Year, because besides working full-time, I also, you know, I was a chaplain for the JC. Word was now out on the street of the gay community of a big man that went out cruising, offering boys and teens drugs. Then he'd bring them back to his place, he'd beat and abuse them, then dump them out later on the street with the garbage. All this while playing the perfect suburbanite neighbor. Even dressing up on weekends as a clown. God bless the children. Volunteering for his political party, throwing barbecues, the irregular ass fucking Jamie Oliver. A bugger, fucker. It was in 1974 that Gacy started his own painting, decorating, and home improvement business. I guess you could say it were a homo improvement business that guaranteed him a never ending supply of ass pussy. Popular in the community, known as Big John, Gacy had a big personality, but an even bigger wallet, offering the teens double the going rate to come and work for him. It weren't offer too good to turn down, but if you go down on the devil, sooner or later you're gonna have to swallow. It was on Mother's Day, 1975, that Gacy fucked his wife for the very last time, then announcing to her that he was becoming a full-time homo. She took the kids and she left, giving him a leisurely schedule to indulge in his homoerotic sickery. Regularly cruising the underbelly of Chicago streets, looking for young meat. Runaways, rent boys, homeless. Casey, now carrying a fake badge with a big light in his car, pretending he were an undercover officer. One more trick of the trade to lure young boys to his car. And it were in the summer of 1975 that teenage boys in Chicago were becoming extinct. And yeah, sure, some of them have been selling sex on the street or have been homeless runaways, but some of them had worked for Gacy. I guess Gacy were picking up the good-looking teenagers that he never was. And when nobody's ever turning up, it was always assumed that they just left town or moved on. And just as Gacy had been filling up these teens' asses, his house was filling up with bodies that he'd murdered and fucked. 
and not always in that order. Horrendous. But the killer clown was about to fuck up. Fifteen-year-old Robert Beast was your all-American kid, played football, had a girlfriend, good family, liked by everybody, and he certainly weren't into cock. It was December 11th when Rob was working at his part-time job at a local pharmacy, getting ready to go to his mother's birthday party that night. When his mother arrived to pick him up after work, he told her that he just needed a minute to talk to a man outside about some construction work to earn some extra money for Christmas. But that was the last time the mother would see her son alive. Employees at the pharmacy had remembered a contractor who'd been hired to fix a leak in the ceiling and that he'd handed him a card and his name was John Gacy. Detectives traced the name and they went to the address hoping that they'd find the teen alive and well. He had a diamond-shaped window in his front door and the front part of his house was dark but there was a street lamp on the sidewalk in front of his residence. And as uh, I stood in front of his door knocking on it, uh, with the reflection of the light into the window, I could see a face staring back at us. And the face faded in into the darkness of the house. It's unknown whether that face was the face of Robert Peast, perhaps saying his final goodbye, or a cry to the detectives for help. But either way, they were left shaken. When they went around to the back of the house and looked in the window, Gacy was there drinking a beer, watching TV, completely unawares of their presence. And he told them that he'd never met Peast. He didn't know what they were talking about. The cops said they had a sinking, eerie feeling when they were in the house, like the cold finger of death, with no finger in their asses. After leaving, and with no reason to suspect Casey, detectives still felt Casey seemed nervous, so they put a tag on him, and with the search for the teen, turning up nothing, it was now a process of elimination. But Casey knew it wasn't going to be so easy for detectives to slight his good character, or even more difficult to make accusations that he were a homo. After all, he'd even had his picture with the first lady, and with two marriages under his belt, and four kids. He were hardly Elton John, but still detectives couldn't shake their hunch, and they got themselves a search warrant. And when they returned to the house three days later, they found Gacy to be aggressive and arrogant. When searching the house, they found a secret crawl space under the floor in Gacy's bedroom. But in that crawl space, there were nothing. Clean as a soul on a cripple's boot. Despite the detectives finding no sign of the teens in Gacy's house, what they did find was a collection of items that may be described as trophies. Items that could have been owned by a teen or a homosexual. Also, one of the detectives, while using the bathroom, smelled something in the plumbing. And although Gacy laughed it off as bad piping, but the experienced detective reported that it was the smell of death. Cops left with the items and started trying to link them to the missing teens. And with what they uncovered, as well as discovering that Gacy had a previous sodomy charge, cops were able to get their second search warrant and start digging. But be careful what you look for. I don't like bondage or anything like this. I, li I like just straight uh, uh, oral and, and anal sex, uh, oral and, and vaginal sex. Just that. I'm not into water sports, I'm not into S&M or uh, chain, chains and whips and all that garbage, no. I'm, in fact, I can't even keep an erection with, with chains and boards. When investigators started digging up Gacy's crawl space, we were a fucking homo house of horrors. With the crawl space filling up with water from the winter thaw, it was like bobbing for apples. But instead of apples, they were decaying corpses. And depending on how long the body had been there, sometimes it was just a black hole full of sludge. And after the first dozen bodies were found, they gave up on being shocked and just cried. What made the crime even more horrific, if that's possible, was that Gacy had hired some of the boys through his construction firm to dig out the crawl space. They were literally digging their own graves. And the man who dressed as a clown 
always had a smile on his face, and made sure he had a beer in your hand, was one of America's most prolific serial killers. And far from being nervous, he even sat in his rec room bar and offered the detectives a drink, knowing that with each shovel full of dirt, they were getting closer to the truth, that he was a cadaver collecting cocksucker who preyed on society's most vulnerable. My encounters were always by happen chance. If you pull up at a stoplight and there's somebody standing there waiting for a bus, do you give them a ride? Do you ask them whether, you know, do you get in anything or you want, want uh, drugs or something like that? That's how it happened. Always a uh, happen chance encounter. There was no, there was no org organization, there was no planning, there was no manipulation. All six bodies were essentially skeletalized. The number of bodies found today are six. Bringing the total to? 21.